Hello and welcome to Hot Topics in Hypnotherapy. My name is Alta Lainez and I'm an HMI graduate and certified hypnotherapist and I will be your host today on the show that explores new ideas, interesting people and important developments in the field of hypnotherapy. Today we're going to be learning about hypnotic entrainment music and how hypnotherapists are using it with their clients. Our first guest is a hypnotherapist, HMI graduate and director of HMI Web TV. Please welcome our guest, Lee Spusta. All my music's imatics, but it's a kind of not a play on words, but I've changed the spelling. Um, there's a science called cymatics. And basically, uh, this guy Hans Jenny, back in the 40s, started looking at how sound frequencies actually produce form uh, in matter. So he would take uh, frequencies and put it through a speaker and have a diaphragm, like a, the skin of a drum, something like that, and a lot of sand on it. And each different frequency tone would produce a different uh, um, mandala-like form. And so he noticed I changed the frequency, I can change the form. And what's interesting is he went on, the more complex frequencies that he would come up with, the more dynamic the, the forms that he would be able to generate. And so even like the uh, most interesting one that I can think of is a dragonfly with yeah. three-dimensional, because he videotaped this stuff, and three-dimensional dragonfly with two sets of wings, the body, the head, the whole thing. And you're like, that's a dragonfly. And then he changes the uh, frequency and it disappears and turns into sand again. And wow. so really, uh, so cymatics is the study of how sound uh, affects matter. Now I changed the spelling, so the way I spell it is P-S-I, M-A-T-I-X, and so P-S-I is Greek for the mind. Yes, I do make and sense. so kind of how sound affects the mind and the body, which is the matter that we're concerned with here. So that's kind of how I Do you have some samples it. with you today? Oh, sure, yeah. So I have some stuff we can play for our studio audience here. Yeah, don't get too excited. <laughs> and so uh, while we're listening to it, I can describe a little bit about some of the process or the way I, I create these things. Um, so basically what you're hearing here, you hear the nice soothing stretched out notes. That, that automatically relaxes people because it's so slow and stretched out. You feel like you can just float into it. So that's just kind of innate, there's not a real heavy science behind that. Uh, however, there's, you'll hear some rhythmic little sounds in there, and, and those uh, kind of stimulate different parts of your mind to go, oh, what's that, what's that? So all of that's just the artistic aspect of it. But underneath all that, what you're not necessarily hearing is that there are frequencies that uh, your brain responds to and like right now we're probably all in more of a beta type consciousness and um, which is like the active thinking mind and um, so it's the busy mind beta consciousness it's uh, anywhere from up up here at 30 cycles per second down to 13 cycles per second that's all our busy active mind where we're all doing this kind of stuff what is the average um, well when we're all awake and busy, we're usually in the beta. It's anywhere in that range I mentioned. Uh, but when we move into a more relaxed, yet a calm and yet mm -hmm. focused state, that's uh, the alpha state, which is between 13 and down to 7. And so we're um, hypnoidal, states mm -hmm. of hypnosis, uh, meditation, um, just relaxed, or if we have a more of a single pointed focus on something, it's the, the uh, alpha state. And so that's most of the time that's what we want to target is an alpha state and, and there are you, lower ones how do you incorporate to. this into your practice uh, well it serves as a tool to help people to relax I mean it's certainly a hypnotic aid uh, but you know there's a whole lot more to it as well like um, not only can you use it with imagery processes you would use the the right type of soundtrack to facilitate the journey but uh, certain frequencies will resonate specifically with certain areas of the body for instance oh. and uh, I mean I can go into a little bit of uh, the background on how all this stuff kind of works mm -hmm. um, basically binaural beats are something 
that it's, it's the most common form of brainwave entrainment and, and what it is. And, and it was discovered beginning in the late 1800s. Uh, but it wasn't until really the 70s that a guy named Robert Monroe, he was a out-of-body traveler. It happened very naturally for him. And he was like, how can I help other people to learn how to do this? And so he looked into binaural beats. He's like, oh, maybe this will help. And what it is is when you have, a, let's say, a frequency that's called 100 cycles per second over here and 110 over here, the difference between those two frequencies is 10. You know, it's just basic math on that level. Right. And so there's a beat frequency of 10 cycles per second. And, you know, you can't really hear it here, but there are some of those frequencies here. And our brain will start to recognize that and do what's called a frequency following response. Oh, okay, that's a dominant frequency. It's close to my uh, brainwave activity. Let me match that, because that's just what organisms do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Robert Monroe, uh, what he did was uh, use these binaural beats. He called his uh, program uh, hemisync, which is short for hemispheric synchronization, because when you take these two tones and you s separate them all the way, one tone's way over here, one's way over here, there's no air in your brain, there shouldn't be, uh, so <laughs> those tones can't uh, bounce together. So you, you're not gonna, that, that tone's really not present, but it should be, and your brain knows it, and so it synthesizes this, this beat frequency. So your brain is generating that mm. 10 cycle per second rhythm. And so your brain's therefore going to be even more inclined to match that brainwave activity because it's generating itself. So he kind of pioneered that and brought mm -hmm. it to people with recordings. Mm -hmm. And since then, there's been a, uh, you know, a lot more research. Um, and that's one of the methods I use. But I like to use other methods, too, that don't require the yes, headphones. Yes, I was getting to that. I was, I was going to ask you. I know that, I know that you use um, cymatics music um, and it uses other methods beyond the binaural, binaural beats and what can you explain to oh, us? Sure, yeah, um, a couple of the primary ones, um, again besides the mood generating aspect of just the music, how you compose it, and the binaural beats, uh, if you create a wide stereo image, uh, actually, you know, if you listen to, let's just say for example, Pink Floyd, uh, something that they recorded with a wide stereophonic image, there are still binaural beats there, technically. And if you wear headphones, it's still in training you. But they didn't put brainwave and training frequencies in there. But the mechanism is still, it's still happening. Your brain is saying, what's happening on this side of my brain and this side? And comparing it in the corpus callosum that uh, communicates between the two halves of your brain to come up with uh, you know, what's, what those frequencies in between are supposed to be. So I used some of those effects. Uh, but also uh, vibroacoustic frequencies. These are low frequencies that um, have a lot of vibrational energy to them. They're kind of more in the bass range. Then, and it's kind of like the didgeridoo or uh, a group, uh, a room full of monks chanting Om, for mm -hmm. instance, mm -hmm. that vibration, you yeah. feel it as well as hear it. That's vibroacoustic. In fact, I have a sound table, a bed that I built that has subwoofers mounted onto it, under it, so that when you lay on it, and you go into trance or relax or listen to the music, it's not just auditory entrainment, but it's also kinesthetic. So it's a whole body wow. experience. So all a the cells connection. in your body are all moving in unison together at the same time. I know that personally I have had the experience to use, um, to use your, um, your entrainment music, and I know that it's taken me beyond deepening levels that I haven't ever really been able to reach and and I was actually the more the more I played it I did start becoming more aware of the of the transitions in which you talk about. Please think. stay tuned and we'll be back with more questions for our guest Lee Spusta. Thank you.